so I will invite Lee Berger to give his presentation on the Australopithecus sediba from South Africa. Thank you very much. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be back here at the ESRF. In fact, uh, I'm going to give you uh, two types of ancient history lessons today. One about the things that I study and some of the both old discoveries and new discoveries, but also one that goes back into the ancient history of the ESRF, where 11 years ago I began what would turn out to be uh, one of my most successful science programs. And I would like to share that with you, its origins, look at some of the results of the work that we did between 9 and 11 years ago, the relevance today, the productivity that came out of that. Then I'm going to show you some sort of new secrets and new things that uh, my colleagues and I are incredibly excited for the opening of this new beam line and hopefully give you some inspiration for some of the things that you can use on this extraordinary new source that's being developed, uh, but maybe more importantly, the uh, new pedestals that can take weights up to 300 uh, kilograms, which just happens to co uh, correspond with a bunch of very heavy discoveries that we have made down in South Africa. Um, my journey with the SRF began with the discovery of this rather unassuming site, a site called Malapa, in what it, just outside of Johannesburg, that I discovered using Google Earth back in uh, August of 2008. Uh, it was at a time where we thought that there were no new major discoveries to be made. The place had been searched over. The site was very unassuming. This is actually the very first picture that I took of that site as I walked up to it, looking at geological maps. A few minutes uh, before this, I had turned over a rock, and in the back of that was a, a wonderful fossil, but uh, it was an antelope fossil, which was pretty much what I'd spent my career finding. Uh, prior to that, but remarkably this little hole in the ground was just a kilometer away from where I'd spent 17 years looking for these ancient human relatives, some of the rarest sought-after objects on Earth. Now, this site is unassuming. It's one of the smallest sites that we've ever discovered out there. This was, by the way, 10 years ago, super high-tech, expensive technology uh, that we applied at, at great cost. You can do a better job with your iPhone today. Uh, than, than this. But just to give you a little bit of the idea of the scale of this site, it's only about six meters across and it's only about four meters deep, that which was exposed at the time. Uh, but what made it such an important site was actually my nine-year-old son and his discovery. On the second visit to the site, a few minutes after arriving, he went off the edge of that little hole and said, Dad, I found a fossil. And he had found this little rock, and I almost didn't look at it because I thought it was going to be an antelope fossil or something completely unimportant that I'd found hundreds of thousands of uh, in my career. But he had these remarkable fossils. And I know you are allowed to gasp at any time you see something amazing like this. You're not gasping. That is, that is a clavicle of a hominid of which I remarkably had done my PhD and was probably the world's only expert on. And when I turned that little concrete-like rock over on the back of it was this canine sticking out. And you're still allowed to gasp whenever you see a fantastic fossil like this. That would change my life. Um, that would change my life because I immediately knew that this was part of a partial skeleton within that. And at that time, they were incredibly rare. We began to prepare parts of it and some remarkable things came out. There you can see part of a mandible on the right, that's an ulna, and some ribs that were coming off. And at that time, we had several blocks, had exciting potential fossils. We decided to move into the sort of radiation sciences. My wife is a radiologist at Johannesburg General Hospital. And so with a, a possible fossil, I snuck the rock down there one morning before patients were, were due, ran it through the scanner, and saw this image. That image was an extraordinary image. It's an image that, in fact, probably had never been seen by any scientist in the history of the search for human origins. That's a skull that you can see in cross-section, entirely contained in this tiny block. We could only see a tiny fragment of it that had been exposed by uh, preparation. This made us rather excited. It also made us rather cautious because no one had ever had the opportunity to stand away from a discovery like this, not just take it all out and make a showpiece out of it. And so there was discussion about how we would handle 
this skull, as you'd see, and you see that we prepared the top of the skull, but we left rock below in place for future generations of scientists to examine, and we underprepared much of this fossil, not exposing the teeth largely at, largely at this time. This would lead also to discovery of more skeletons. On the right, you see the skeleton that Matthew discovered. On the left hand is one I discovered a few weeks later. In the ensuing journey over the next several years, we would discover up to six individuals, but by hardly trying. Quite literally, as we opened up a new area of the site, we would encounter either another individual or more of these remarkable skeletons. That's when my synchrotron journey began, before we decided to publish it. Before we decided to put this out to the world, I wanted to get a better look at that in working with Paul Taffaro and the great teams here at, uh, at uh, the ESRF. We brought this skull, it was one of the first time a major hominid fossil had been transported out of South Africa with all the government security you can imagine to actually do that. And perhaps the first time in history, a undescribed fossil that was intended to be a holotype, we knew it was a new species, was transported out to undergo um, work in this because the scanners that we had to look in these were woefully inadequate at the time and couldn't actually give us great imaging of this fossil. We also brought other material, including postcranial material. And I'm rather glad we did, with a much uh, uh, darker haired Paul Taffaro, and I had both more hair and darker hair at that time amongst others. We began to work with this uh, material on the old beam line and began to um, get extraordinary results. This is an external uh, look at that material, but really it wasn't the external look. Um, all those uh, surface scanners were not common at that time. It was really the ability to do things like this that were the first parts of what we began to see. The ability to, to look at every level, at, at, at measures that no one had ever looked inside of an ancient human relative before, imaging it in a way that was not only incredibly valuable scientifically, but these sort of emotive in, uh, images uh, entranced the public with the idea of this new technology that we could use. In fact, 60 Minutes followed us to hear the, the new show in the United States to film us as we uh, undertook this one-of-a-kind experiment. The images are, are extraordinary that, we, that came from that work. They've been used in both downgraded levels and upgraded levels by our teams of scientists over the years and are still used today and are still considered probably state-of-the-art images. Papers would appear in major journals on, on brain morphology, internal morphology, uh, the dentition of these, uh, of, of Sediba and others that would really allow us to do something that, that others hadn't done before, including put the skeleton together, begin building what they look like, which would ultimately re really result in reconstructions of locomotion and the physical abilities of that. I was living the scientific dream with my colleagues. Uh, we had three special editions of science over four years. Uh, to date, over 18 papers have appeared in the journal Science on Sediba, one in Nature, and over, over uh, 80 papers in refereed journals have come in the last decade since we published in April of 2010. Um, it has been an extraordinary scientific achievement, and a lot of it, a great deal of it based upon that initial work, that initial imaging that we created here at the ESRF. But we also had a public use for that data. And I want to speak strongly to those of you who are in cultural and the cultural heritage, paleontology, paleoanthropology, because what these images, what those remarkable images you saw and many, many others that uh, we, cre uh, we created coming out of this synchrotron scanning became images that were used all over the world and in many public spheres, inspiring artists to create work, inspiring other scientists to do better science, inspiring the public to engage with these fossils, even inspiring Stan Lee to make Sediba the origins of X-Men, you see over on the right, and which was a great way to reach the public when you think that a fossil that that n newly developed actually gained that sort of uh, a public appeal. And I think a great deal of that was due to the incredible images that were produced here that were useful for both science and for the public. It also allowed Sediba to be named, uh, in fact, uh, in December of, the, 
of last year as one of the 10 most important scientific discoveries of the last decade. That makes us very proud to see fossil hominids, fossils of any kind that are making those sort of lists along with the great other scientific achievements that are being done in both space and at places like the ESRF. I want to throw some statistics out here and these are not meant to brag, they're meant to inspire you to use these beam lines and to do this kind of work. As I just said, it was recognized as among top 10 scientific discoveries of the last decade. We have put more, out more than 80 peer-reviewed papers and right now Sadiba has 525 citations, the original paper, and that's, well, many physics papers and stuff have more, that is a huge number in that period for a paleontological paper. More than 150 collaborating scientists are on this, making it one of the larger scientific projects in the world, certainly in the paleo sciences. We've delivered more than 125 keynote addresses and won 29 prizes and awards issued to scientists and papers that have been produced off this. Over $345 million in value of coverage has been developed and South African government obviously likes that a lot. So does my university and so should the ESRF off things like that. More than 8,000 popular articles have been written about Sadiba and a reach, and that's the number of hits and number of impressions it's made around the world of more than 30 billion in 10 years. And those are numbers that are important for you to understand because it's just a fossil. It's a fossil of an ancient human, but it's part of the way in which we can do science um, with this type of data in a rapid way and in a public way that allows us to have that. And now I'm going to talk about new discoveries that I hope to be bringing to this new bean line, Mr. Director, um, in the next uh, year and a half or so when they open. One of the unusual things and coincidences is come we started making really big discoveries. Not big in the public idea, but big in the rock idea. Like this particular one, which you can see is a very large rock. That rock at that time weighed about 60 kilograms. Um, inside of it, we could see sticking out the back of it. That is the mandible with a tooth of an ancient hominid, which quite interestingly happened to fit right onto a piece that we'd found at the site that fit onto the jawbone of that first hominid that Matthew found. So we knew that there was a good chance there was the rest of Carabo, the fir first hominid from Malapa inside of that. We tried again in my wife's facility at the hospital when no patients were there to actually scan it and we found to our pleasure that this rock, this gigantic rock, which was over 70 centimeters across and 50 centimeters deep, was, was beautifully translucent to, to x-rays, um, to, to clinical x-rays. You could actually see the bones in them. I'll just slow that down and give you a little picture. You can see the bones were appearing, but it wasn't clear enough to do anything major with that at that time. But of course, there was no synchrotron facility, no beams really on the planet that could take something uh, of that weight. When we prepared part of that block in order to see that there was indeed a hominid skeleton, there was a spectacular one inside. It's in fact appears to be the entire rest of the first hominid that we discovered at Malapa, which luckily is the type specimen. That's one layer of it. There's an entire another layer we can see in clinical x-rays under it. But again, it was never going to be scanned in a synchrotron. The biggest objects that we were going to put in something like this were sort of the size of that skull. And so we moved heaven and earth to try and work on this. We actually took it to the United States to one of the largest micro-focused CT scanners in the world, and one of the most powerful ones at Lockheed Martin in Dallas, Texas. And we tried to get images inside of this rock, and they didn't look very good. They failed. And we're not sure why they fail, because the Malapa material is superb in synchrotron, it's superb in clinical x-ray, and it doesn't work in any of the micro CTs that we have. And so we are very excited, Mr. Director, to potentially bring a large object that seems designed for this new beam line and should be a perfect working case to see a very important fossil that we may then leave for future generations of scientists to save data within that. This is a spectacular discovery. What you're looking at there was that area that was black and just above the skull of that, uh, just above the skull of the, the holotype of Sediba that Matthew had discovered. What that appears to be is fossilized skin, dating to two million years before present, including venous structures, the base of hair roots, follicles, and other things. We, again, have attempted to use 
our own microfocus CT scanners and others, and the imaging isn't great, but again, I have great hope because this looks like the kind of thing synchrotron was designed to see. And if so, we may be able to look at things like hair follicles, whether it's fur or hair, and other amazing things that I think no one ever thought would come out of a hominid. And so that's on the table for the next generation of these, of these beam lines. And of course, we've continued to work. I haven't spoken about Homo naledi. We've continued to work within those systems, those extraordinary underground systems that over the past five years, just outside of Johannesburg, have, uh, we've recovered more individual hominid remains than in the entire history of the search for human origins on the continent of Africa from one locality, from one site system. And we've been continuing to work in there and we've encountered problems. Problems that can't be solved because the material is not coming out in small fragments. It's actually coming out in big pieces like this, where you have uh, large samples of material. We're now at over two and a half thousand individual remains. It's actually probably closer to 3,000 based on new discoveries. Paul Taffero and others in this room will be thrilled to see we have lots and lots of teeth at different ages. And synchrotron gives us the uh, option of actually sectioning certain teeth without cutting teeth. Believe it or not, to look at growth and development and rates of growth and other factors, we have traditionally destroyed these precious fossils to do it. And, and there are still studies that need to do that. But one of the advantages of synchrotron, I certainly believe this new beam line will give us, is less damage and the ability to more carefully choose these associated groups of, of fossil teeth that we've discovered. And then we have spectacular fossils like this from the rising star cave system. I know you're all shocked when you see a lump like that. That is a very special lump, though. It's one of three recovered in C2 um, as we noticed that there was a feature that seemed to be cohesive in another chamber, a different chamber from the Dinaletti chamber. And so we managed to take this feature out in three pieces. It had to be three pieces because no object or human can exceed 18 centimeters to get in or out of this cave. You have to go 12 meters down an 18 centimeter wide chute to get into it, so we could not take a object larger than this. And when we put this back in my wife's uh, medical CT at the hospital, we saw beautiful things. Beautiful things that surprised us. Surprised us in their completion and complexity. That is part of an articulated dentition, an upper and lower of a child that's likely something like 10 years old. There appear to be parts of the skull and other parts. And when you begin, and, and when we tried micro CT, this doesn't fit within a micro CT scanner. It's too big. It's too big to fit in any type of conventional micro CT scanner uh, that we have, and, but there are things to be seen in there. This is just a rough preparation of those clinical CTs of the stuff that surrounds that little maxilla and mandible. And I would point to things like the foot that you can see here, articulated. The hand that you can see right here that is, that is articulated and in a death grip. And all of these are bones and there are other finger bones. There are actually lots of ribs and stuff. There are also a beautiful sets of teeth of maybe more than just one individual in this. An extraordinary thing, and we again, need this new beam line to actually see into it because we don't want to redo, uh, remove this. This is not a hard rock situation like Malapa or, uh, uh, or Sadiba was found in. This is just in dirt. And if we remove this packaging, we potentially um, lo uh, lose all of that extraordinary information that may be recovered from a, a situation like this. And it also tells us we need to leave more of these features and such intact. There's a lot of information to be, uh, to be got from this. So I'm gonna end today, but I want to say that uh, I think we are in one of the most exciting ages of discovery and science in cultural heritage and study of both deep paleontology, deep time, and the deep human journey. Because not only are we making more discoveries, and we've clearly demonstrated that there is more out there to be found, but we've done it in an age where we can do things and extract information that scientists 20 years ago couldn't dream of doing. And places like the ESRF are at the very front of that. You're looking at one of a, a, a leader of one of the largest teams of scientists in the paleo sciences in the world. And we have experimented with all the modalities, 
all the x-ray modalities. And while many of them give brilliant results, that the, the synchrotron results we achieved even 11 years ago are still the gold standard for that. I think you're going to hear that a lot uh, during the course of this, uh, this conference, but I hope that we've been able to give you some inspiration around the potential, both the output potential of data from places like the synchrotron, the publishability of data from the synchrotron, the excitement of data from the synchrotron, and also ways of using new objects that nothing could deal with and would have been destroyed in the process of preparation that this new beam line will offer us. Um, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Oh. It takes a moment, I think. Does it work? Yeah, perfect. Thank you so much, Lee. That was really, really exciting. So I would like to know if you have any question to Lee. Yes? Uh, what is the composition of the soft tissue fossil, the scalp section that you showed? We're not really sure. We conducted Raman studies on it and other you know, x-ray diffraction. What it appears to be is it was likely to be mummified skin that displaced itself in the, in the preservation process. The fossil was preserved in calcium carbonate very quickly, potentially due to insect activity, interestingly, around it, which then pulled it away. And there seems to be some um, solidification that occurred in there, but we're not exactly sure. And some of the potential that we have um, on potentially even other beam lines as we begin to explore what the causality of this is, I uh, without knowing exactly how it happened, that's going to be part of the stake because we can't see beyond the back, um, I suspect that this is not an uncommon occurrence. Um, on the back of that large block we're going to be bringing is an antelope fossil that clearly has skin on it. Um, and there may be even be muscle tissue preserved within that. Uh, we have from the other hominid, at least one other hominid, uh, what appears to be skin preservation, a uh, very convincing skin preservation. I suspect that what happened in the past, because of the way we are preparing things manually in large areas of paleontology, we were wiping through that, that evidence because we didn't believe it existed. I think that's true in dinosaur paleontology. Well, I know it's true in dinosaur paleontology. I think it's true in, in many others, and it's, it's probably, I, I think that one of the values that, that things like synchrotron are going to offer us. And there are, I, we can speak to the downsides of over radiation and stuff and talk to that in a moment, but the upsides are it being able to conserve situations like that for either future modalities or future scientists. Thank you. Any other question? <laughs> yeah, it was great. I mean, uh, Really exciting. Uh, there's Thank so you. much to do still. Uh, Thank you. Can you. Clearly see it. Uh, I'm, I have a curiosity. Uh, um, I remember that one of the hypotheses uh, for um, uh, Sediba was a child that fell into a pit. But it looks like now you have many uh, uh, hominids in the same pit. And also, what I found quite uh, quite amazing is by looking at your fossil. Maybe I'm saying something stupid. It looks like uh, that um, somehow all the bones are broken and uh, somewhat displaced from from each other. Is this just uh, natural? Because when, you know you would uh, expect uh, that. Uh, you know, is this a burial? I mean, there's uh, so many things one can imagine and ask. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So so um, so. The answer to that, surprisingly, is. It was very easy to formulate hypotheses a decade or 12 years ago on how these things were because we viewed these ancient hominids as much closer to apes than humans, such as that. Uh, Sidibe is two million years old, and so we were looking for natural ways in which something could die. die. And so we were hypothesizing water holes and risking their lives. Now, in Sidiba, Australopithecus Sidiba, there is some evidence that individuals at least at or near the time of death suffered falls, breakages of bones, break it, uh, um, forearm fractures. At least two of them seem to have those, but we don't know whether that happened after death, was the cause of death, or 
happened as some kind of fall like that. Um, what we do know is that, that most of those hominids actually from Malop are, are articulated and intact, or as close to it as most of us paleontologists ever dream of in our, in our lives. This is a second uh, skeleton. But, the, but the, uh, the disturbance appears to be due to a phenomena that uh, we're working on. We haven't deeply published it yet, but it's, it's, it'll be coming out in the near future, that most of the malaposite was constructed by termites. Uh, that is, termites actually built calcium carbonate hills over top of these fossils, and that's what allowed the preservation, but also probably some of the shifting and disturbance. The rising star cave system, where Homo naledi comes from, is completely different. Um, we have not found any evidence that, that they were killed by predators, that any of them have any significant injuries on them. They weren't killed in a mass death. They weren't brought in there by flood. They came in at different times. And, um, my colleagues and I proposed at the time that, that the, the last remain answer was that this incredible assemblage of now probably approaching 30 different individual hominids, and we're not even trying. We know there are more there, um, in, in, in six or seven different locations was likely due to deliberate body disposal. That seems impossible given that they have brain sizes just larger than chimpanzees. Uh, but they're at much younger age, at about uh, 250,000 years approximately uh, in that area. But people say that that's largely impossible. I think you're hopefully this year are going to see um, some pretty extraordinary new evidence that, that looks into the hypothesis of why they're there and why they're like that. It could be a blurry. Uh, that is a possibility I'm not going to say out loud on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Do you have any yet yeah, other questions? Just a technical question. Uh, what was the energy of the synchrotron radiation and compared to the energy in your, in your wife's hospital instrument? <laughs> uh, okay, so my, my wife's hospital instruments are running on standard protocols that we usually use a bone protocol on, so whatever. Uh, the, it, the energy differences have changed over the last 11 years. And we, by the way, run an a weekly scanning program, scanning blocks, trying to make discoveries like that. Every, every Tuesday morning, we're sitting there with our patients in line, ready to actually go through. Paul can answer the energy questions on the, on the skull. Yes, 96 kilo electron volts in monochromatic on ID 17. Uh, just for the, the fun part, doing that on BM18 in a bit more than one year, uh, you can go to 350 kilo electron volts instead of 96, that was the <laughs> maximum. And it would not take four days, but more something like half a day or even less for much better quality. So just a small detail. <laughs>